Okay, it's 1.30. Welcome to Allie McCormick, Nicole Lewis, Becky Skeen, and Rebecca Wiederhold. I want to pronounce it the German way. Um, so they will present today Beyond Books 1 and 2. We're going to start with one, Cataloging Archival Materials. And Aaron Mendoza will introduce our presenters. Hey everybody, thanks for coming today. Um, so Rita, you kind of already introduced our group, but we've got Allison McCormick, uh, original cataloger for special collections at University of Utah. Nicole Lewis, lead cataloger at the University of Utah. Becky Skeen is special collections cataloging librarian at Utah State University. And Rebecca Wiederhold, uh, technical services archivist at BYU. Take it away guys. Hi everyone, thank you so much for joining us today. Um, I'm Allie McCormick, I'm one of the co-presenters for this, uh, and I'll also kind of be your MC uh, throughout the next couple hours. Here is our schedule for today. Um, so we are taking up two sessions this afternoon. Uh, we do hope you'll stick around for the whole thing. Um, though, of course, if there's only one particular aspect of archival cataloging that you're interested in, um, you're welcome to kind of come and go as best works for you. And uh, if you would like to download a copy of this slideshow so that you can make your own annotations or reference later, um, here's a short link that we have uh, where you can do that pretty easily. So without further ado, uh, let's get started with an introduction to archival cataloging. So what does that mean? What is archival cataloging? Uh, cataloging very basically tells us what something is and where we can find it. That's the point of a catalog record. Uh, but a bibliographic record for archival materials is different than a finding aid. Um, most obviously, it's not going to have that full box folder item listing that a finding aid would have. And so we'll be talking today about um, making collection level records for these archival collections. As most of you know, finding aids often live in their own databases. Uh, the University of Utah, for example, uses Archives West. And that's well and good. Um, those databases are often optimized for finding aids. But having them siloed like that uh, does have some limitations. But for example, they often can't be cross-referenced with other library materials, uh, which is a big hindrance. I work a lot with um, first year students, for example, and a lot of times they have no idea that they even want to look at archival materials. And if the finding aids are in their own database and not accessible via the library catalog, they're quite simply never going to find them. Uh, however, when collection level records are searchable in your library catalog, uh, that does allow students to find, for example, the diaries or photographs of a historical figure that they are writing a paper on. And hopefully that will be enough to uh, invite them into the reading room so we can you know, help them find what they're looking for. Uh, the archival cataloging does make use of some specialized standards that you're not going to find uh, in other kinds of materials. Uh, the most common one is DAX, describing archives of content standard. Um, but there's also descriptive cataloging of rare materials, which is kind of broken up into uh, different um, categories based on kind of material. Though you'll also see archival records uh, created in AACR2, RDA, or a combination of those standards. Uh, in fact, RDA was partially based on DAX. Um, so I find that those two standards uh, can work together really well. And my personal preference for working with archival materials is to use a combination of DAX and RDA. So that's just a, a very quick introduction uh, to archival cataloging. And so without further ado, I will pass this along to Rebecca um, to start off, off, us off with the uh, cataloging manuscripts. All right, just getting switched over. Great. Well, I was excited to see that there was interest in following up on our special collections cataloging workshop from last year's ULA with more information about cataloging archival materials. Although I'll be talking about cataloging manuscripts today, 
I'm focusing on how to catalog individual manuscripts as opposed to manuscript collections. I provided that a full- It's not broken at all? Yeah. That is probably home from my office. What? I provided a full introduction to cataloging manuscript collections in last year's workshop. If you missed it or want a refresher, we're reprising these segments in a series of webinars sponsored by ULA's Technical Services Roundtable. Earlier this month, Nicole uh, presented a webinar on cataloging zines. Ali will be teaching about cataloging artist books in October. My presentation on cataloging manuscript collections will take place in November. And the final workshop reboot will be taught by Becky on poster cataloging in December. Watch for the registration links in your email from Jessica Bryman. As I get started today, I also want to clarify what I mean by the term manuscript. While manuscript can mean any document that was written by hand, typewritten documents are also considered manuscripts. The term has come to be understood to include any written, typed, or word processing copy of an author's work as distinguished from the version of the work presented as a printed and distributed or published version. As BYU's technical services archivist, my day-to-day -day job involves cataloging manuscript collections of all types. Today, I'll be focusing on individual textual manuscripts. In 2005, the Society of American Archivists adopted Describing Arch Archives, a content standard, or DAX, as the official standard of the US archival community. DAX is intentionally flexible and can be used for archival cataloging of all formats of materials, including for the description of individual unpublished manuscripts but its strength lies in the hierarchical structure of multi-level descriptions, such as finding aids for aggregate collections. Throughout the presentation, I'll be introducing you to two other standards that are useful for describing individual manuscripts, but you can still use DAX if it provides sufficient instruction for your needs. If you use DAX, make sure you're using the second edition. Also, the link on this slide will take you to a new up-to-date version of the standard, so you can see changes in real time as opposed to using the print version. This website is more user-friendly than the GitHub version. So how is cataloging a single manuscript different from cataloging an archival collection? When cataloging an archival collection, there generally isn't enough time or space to describe very much of it in extensive detail. That work is done by the finding aid, so the collective mark record is necessarily less detailed. When describing a single manuscript, distinguishing characteristics can assume more importance. The two standards I'll be covering today can be seen as bridging standards. They help the archivist world and the rare book catalogers world come together in a way that allows for improved access to these materials. Manuscripts are generally unique. They often don't have titles. Transcription is usually unimportant. As byproducts of human activity, single manuscripts are not usually created as self-conscious products. So the cataloger needs to explain what the item is and what its context of production and use was. These materials are different enough from published books that they require detailed cataloging guidelines that help to identify the basic required elements of title, date, and extent. Of course, item level description is far more time consuming than collection level description, but it provides significantly more detail, fuller access, and better security for items. For archival collections, it's always preferable to create a collection level record first before taking the time to create item level description for any of the individual items from the collection. There's not enough time in this shortened workshop to fully cover the use of each standard. However, I can introduce you to major concepts and show you where to go for more in-depth information. Archival manuscripts' importance lies in their aggregate rather than in themselves as individual items. So DAX is sufficient for collection level description and archival control. However, literary manuscripts and archival manuscripts can be better served by item level cataloging to bring out their individual characteristics and value. For bibliographic control of older manuscripts, there's a standard called Descriptive Cataloging of Ancient, Medieval, Renaissance, and Early Modern Manuscripts, or AMRAM. The general cutoff date for use of the AMRAM standard is early to mid 1600s, when finished manuscripts began to have far more in common with printed books than with modern literary manuscripts. AMRAM was originally published in 2003 and is no longer in print, but you can find the manual freely available on RBMS's website as a printable PDF. See the link. The modern counterpart to AMRAM is a more recent addition to the DCRM suite of cataloging handbooks called Descriptive Cataloging of Rare Materials Manuscripts, or DCRM MSS. As the name implies, this manual is specifically intended for more valuable or rare materials which call for individual description. 
In 2004, the Society of American Archivists asked the Rare Books and Manuscripts section of the Association of College and Research Libraries to create a companion standard to DAX that would provide instructions for describing monu modern manuscripts at the item level. The manual was completed in 2016 and I was able to attend the first training workshop that summer. You can access a free PDF online through the RBMS website. When you've chosen the cataloging standard you'll be using, it's important to add its description convention source code in field 040 subfield E. I'm displaying the codes for the three standards already discussed, but at the bottom of this list you see APPM, which designates that a record was cataloged using archives, personal papers, and manuscripts, or APPM. Use of this standard has steadily declined over the decade and a half since DAX was developed and endorsed by the Society of American Archivists. While APPM was an important contribution to archival cataloging, DAX has been able to improve upon its guidelines to provide arguably better access to these important collections. I'll also note, as Ali said, that RDA guidelines can be used jointly with any of these other specialized standards. If you use RDA and decide to supplement with DAX, AMRAM, or DCRM MSS, you'll simply repeat the 040 subfield E to add the second code. As a side note, I just wanted to share a quick cataloging tip that may be helpful to you as you start using different cataloging standards. Sometimes I like to look at records in WorldCat to see how other catalogers have handled similar cataloging issues. You can limit your search results in WorldCat by using the descriptive conventions or DX prefix. You can also narrow it down by the date cataloged to look at only recently cataloged records using date created by MARC or DM. Putting together this training, I was curious how many other institutions are using AMRAM. So I checked WorldCat and found 152 records cataloged since the beginning of 2020 and noted that Columbia University, Bryn Mawr College, and Duke University are contributing a large chunk of the AMRAM records in WorldCat, which could point you to, in the direction of who, might, who you might contact for help in understanding these cataloging roles. So the first section of both AMRAM and DCRM MSS contains general rules. I recommend reading the scope for each standard as you work to determine which will be best for use in describing the manuscripts you're working with. Remember that a good rule of thumb to follow is to use AMRAM for manuscripts produced before the mid 17th century, especially for literary manuscripts. Generally use DCRM MSS for item level description of modern manuscripts. For comparison's sake, Many of the remaining slides will show AMRAM guidelines in the left column and DCRM MSS in the right column. The general rules section of both standards indicate that the chief source for most cataloging information is the manuscript itself. AMRAM is more particular about which areas of the item information can come from and in what order to take the information, including title page, colophon, contents lists, cover, etc. DCRM MSS expands the source of information to include the manuscripts housing, accompanying materials, including other archival materials within a collection, and some external sources. Both standards allow for the use of reference sources if an item is discussed in a published description, study, or edition. One major difference between these two standards is in their use of square brackets. DCRM MSS does not use square brackets for supplied information whereas AMRAM requires square brackets for any cataloger editions, transcribed text from non-contemporary editions to the manuscript, and any information from sources outside the manuscript entirely. Another important difference between the guidelines is the prevalence of transcription across AMRAM, whereas DCRM MSS only requires transcription for formal titles and statements of responsibility. Since there's more transcription using AMRAM and pre-modern text is so non-standardized, AMRAM provides detailed instruction for handling irregular spellings, punctuation, capitalization, and abbreviations. AMRAM also provides guidance for how to enter pre-modern letter forms, such as the archaic form of the letter S that almost looks like an F. Missing letters and illegible text are replaced with hyphens for each missing letter or ellipses, for an unknown number of missing letters, all within square brackets. DCRM MSS deals additionally with diacritics and symbols, hyphens at line endings, initials, and spacing issues. Missing and illegible text should be entered as ellipses within square brackets. 
There are a few fixed fields to consider when cataloging single manuscripts. Type of record will be coded as T. This is a code specifically used for manuscript language material. As I mentioned at the outset of this presentation, manuscript materials don't always have to be handwritten. They can be typewritten documents or even printed records. The distinction lies in their non-published state or their unique existence as a single instance. Other types of manuscript materials can be cataloged individually as well, such as manuscript music or maps. And these are coded respectively D or F, but this training is for textual materials only. For bibliographic level, there are generally two codes to consider. For monographs or single items that are not part of a larger manuscript collection, use M. Although it is used less regularly, the D code for a subunit would be appropriate when you're creating a catalog record for an individual item that exists as part of a larger archival collection. If an item is of particular value or importance to the library's collections, you can bring out significant traits of the item by giving it its own catalog record, even if it's part of a collective record elsewhere. In the items record, the archival collection should be named in the 773 field. Moving on to the title, I'll address formal titles first, since these tend to be much less common for manuscript texts. A published book will generally always self-identify the title, if not on a title page, then at least on a cover or spine. Manuscript materials are much less straightforward, but they can have ready-made titles. If the creator has written or typed something that looks like a title, especially if it's accompanied by a statement of responsibility, that can be considered a formal title. For both AMREM and DCRM MSS, record in a note the location within the item where the title was obtained. DCRM MSS defines a formal title as the title of the work as assigned at the point of creation or production, or historically associated with the work, typically appearing on a manuscript's title page, colophon, or caption, but occasionally appearing elsewhere in the manuscript or in reference sources. If a manuscript item has been part of an archival collection, the donor may have provided titles on a folder, for example. AMREM instructions for formal titles mainly apply to literary manuscripts and specify what the title proper, that the title proper should be transcribed exactly in terms of wording, order, and spelling, but not necessarily punctuation and capitalization. Abbreviations should be expanded and punctuation follows modern convention. You do have the option to reject a formal title if it's illegible, inaccurate, or misleading. Use the instructions for devising a title instead. Using either AMREM or DCRM MSS, you will have frequent opportunity to devise a title due to the lack of formal titles for most archival manuscript materials. DCRM MSS gives basic general requirements that the title should identify the form or, gener or genre of the material, such as diary, sermon, account book, play, etc., and the creator's name, if known. The examples of devised titles I've listed here show that the order of information in the title is not important, other than that your institution should develop a consistent practice internally. AMREM gives even less instruction. If a title possesses no title pe peculiar to itself, supply a brief descriptive title that reflects the genre and nature of the material. As you see, there's flexibility for the cataloger to create a title based on the user's particular needs. There are some specific types of materials that often do not have a formal title for which these standards do outline specific instruction in formulating a devised title. I'll go through each of these scenarios. Both AMREM and DCRM MSS provide specific guidance for the formulation of a devised title for letters and other forms of correspondence as seen in this table. All elements of the title for letters using AMREM are required if known. The order of elements of the title is also required, including the form term letter, date of writing, place of writing, name of addressee, and place to which the letter is addressed. Note that the person who wrote the letter is not included in the title, but only in the 100 field. The full title is then enclosed in square brackets. For DCRM MSS devised titles for letters, there are four required elements, form, creator, recipient, and date, and three optional elements, creator's address, recipient's address, and subject or other distinguishing features. No brackets are used in DCRM MSS titles. For DCRM MSS, the order of title elements and the inclusion of optional elements is left up to the cataloging institution, 
but consistent practice is strongly encouraged. For single legal documents and archival records, such as wills, deeds, charters, mortgages, leases, court records, warrants, etc., formulation of a devised title is addressed in both standards. AMREM, again, prescribes the order of required elements for the title, including a word or brief phrase to characterize the type of document, the date of execution, expressed as year, month, day, the name of the principal party or parties involved, or to whom the document is directed, and the occasion for the document expressly, expressed concisely. Unknown elements are simply omitted from the title. DCRM MSS's required elements for devised titles of legal documents differ slightly to include form, creator or petitioner, recipient, and date of creation. Optional elements include the occasion for the document and the place of its creation. Again, DCRM MSS allows for these elements to be presented in any order, provided the cataloging institution uses a consistent pattern for title creation. AMREM does not specifically address devising titles for sermons, speeches, lectures, etc. In this case, the cataloger is instructed to supply a brief descriptive title that reflects the genre and nature of the material. DCRM MSS again lists required and optional elements. Once again, the title must include a term for the form, such as sermon, speech, or lecture, and the creator's name. Other optional elements include the subject and the place and date of delivery. For a single poem, song, hymn, or other work in verse that lacks a formal title, AMREM does not specifically address devising a title. However, DCRM MSS instructs to simply use the first line of the title or line of the text as the title. You should make a note of the source of the title in such a case. Material type is a unique element of the title field that is required for use in all titles formulated by DCRM MSS guidelines. It does not have a counterpart in AMREM. Because unpublished textual materials can be reworked or reproduced in a number of ways and multiple times, it can be very useful information for the researcher to know what form of the work they will be looking at. This information is given in the material type element of the title and includes the physical, creative, and intellectual status of the manuscript. It's preceded by a colon and is followed by the statement of responsibility if there is one. Required elements are the method of production and the method of reproduction. This indicates whether the item is handwritten or typescript and whether or not the item is a reproduction. Optionally, if it is known the manuscript is written in the creator's hand, use the term autograph. Record if it is signed or initialed by the creator as well. Status of the manuscript in the creative process can also be useful information to record. Was this a draft, a galley proof, a typescript synopsis with corrections? And finally, indicate the completeness of the item, i.e. whether it is a fragment, incomplete, or unfinished, if applicable. It will depend on your institutional practice and cataloger's judgment whether or not it is worth it to spend time ascertaining and recording optional elements. Single manuscript items often do not explicitly have a place or date of production on the item. Keep in mind that these materials are unpublished, so the appropriate second indicator to use for the 264 is zero for production statement. I've included here a table of a few of the key points to remember when keying the 264. Note that the source of information for AMREM cataloging is only the item itself, whereas DCRM MSS allows for the place and date to be supplied from other sources, which can include the manuscripts accompanying materials or reference sources. AMREM only indicates use of a 264 for literary manuscripts. For archival materials, this information is omitted. Both standards require some standardization of the date. Detailed instruction is included for handling dates in other calendar systems and for supplying dates when ambiguity exists. Multiple places of production, ranges of production dates, and fictitious or incomplete, or sorry, incorrect places and dates are handled in DCRMS as, as well. Note that supplied information should be enclosed in square brackets using AMREM, but brackets are not used with DCRM MSS. A note should be added to indicate where supplied information was taken from. 
AMREM requires that the extent of an item be described according to the terminology suggested by the physical format of the manuscript. For most items, this will be in terms of the number of leaves, regardless of whether the manuscript has been paginated or not. Sheets, rolls, and membranes are also allowed. DCRM MSS can be simpler, requiring the extent to be recorded in terms of the number of physical units, choosing from the terms item, volume, roll, microfilm reel, or microfiche. Optionally, the extent can be qualified with the total number of leaves or pages. For both standards, blank leaves are included in the total count. The support material is also recorded. Parchment and paper are the most common. For vellum, default to use of the broader term parchment as well. For recording illustrations, AMREM contains very brief instruction to record all types of illustrative matter as illustrations. Maps are the singular exception to this rule. For minor, for minor textual embellishments that are common to early manuscripts, do not record these as illustrations. DCRM MSS also allows for all illustrative material to be listed as illustrations, although a parenthetical description of the graphic process or technique is also allowed, terms such as watercolors, drawings, or photographs. Optionally, specific illustrative terms can be applied as normal. For dimensions, AMREM requires measurements be listed in millimeters. Folded items are measured laid open. Under DCRM MSS, the standard of measurement is centimeters, unless the item is under 10 centimeters. If folded, the item should be measured according to how it is meant to be used. A folded letter that has to be unfolded to be read would be measured unfolded. However, a multi-leaf document with text not crossing the fold would be measured in its folded state. A large number of notes are required in the catalog record with when certain conditions apply and when information is available. Don't be overwhelmed by the list. When using the AMREM manual, each required note is mentioned in the area of the catalog record to which the note relates. These notes help to distinguish various manuscripts from one another, provide context outside of information found within the item itself, and provide additional information that has no other place in the catalog to be recorded. Any transcribed text that is included in a note should be enclosed in quotation marks. Notes can be selectively augmented, abbreviated, or added according to local cataloging policies and requirements. DCRM MSS contains a differing set of required notes as it is not as heavily based on the description of literary manuscripts and has close ties to the DAC standard for description of archival materials. Notes can deal with any aspect of the manuscript, including its content, context, provenance, and conditions of use. Because manuscripts are unique artifacts, all notes will be general rather than copy specific. When adding notes to justify access points for personal or corporate names, titles, genre forms, physical characteristics, provenance, etc., use terms taken from lists of controlled vocabularies whenever possible. When appropriate, combine two or more related notes to make one note. Assigning subject headings to records for individual manuscripts is in some ways similar to assigning subjects to any other type of work in terms of addressing their topical content. There are unique characteristics of manuscripts that need to be brought out, however, so it's important to consult Library of Congress's subject headings manual. I've listed it here a few of the most common instruction sheets I find myself referencing when cataloging manuscripts. There are many more potentially relevant sheets to utilize. I won't go into great detail about any of them, but you can access the full manual through Catalogger's desktop. They're also freely available as PDFs at the Library of Congress website. BYU's manuscript collections contain a lot of diaries, letters, documents such as deeds or wills, manuscript or typescript drafts of works that were later published, reminiscences, and biographical sketches. We also have photocopies of many of these types of materials, so understanding how to apply subjects for each category of material is very helpful. I've included in this list the instruction sheet for archives and archival resources. However, the free floating form subdivision archives should only be applied to collection level descriptions. When describing individual documents from a corporate or personal archive, this subdivision should not be included. I'll end my presentation here out of interest for time, although there is much more to learn about the cataloging of individual manuscript items. I encourage you to download the AMREM and DCRM MSS PDFs and explore each of the standards. Thanks.
Thanks, Rebecca. Uh, let me share my screen now and we can move along to cataloging photographs. All right, so um, how do we catalog photographs uh, in an archive? Um, I just wanted to provide a few images of what I mean when I say photographs, because there are quite a few different types of items uh, that fall under that category. Um, this could be like a Polaroid, you know, very familiar kind of picture, a tin type, a photograph album, uh, photo slides, negatives, and a bunch of different kinds of materials. And so the first thing you have to determine when you have a collection of photographs uh, is whether these are projected or non-projected graphics, because um, they are cataloged differently. Um, I will say that non-projected graphics are a lot more common, at least for me. Um, these include photo negatives, photo prints, um, certain kinds of postcards, for example. Whereas projected graphics include things like film strips and film slips. Slides, transparencies, which is a category that includes x-rays, um, and a couple other different kinds of things. Uh, if your collection has both projected and non-projected graphics, you're going to have to catalog it on a mixed materials work form, uh, which we'll cover at the very end of the presentation today. Uh, so as I said, non-projected graphics are what I most commonly come across, so I'm going to start with those. Uh, and we'll begin by going over the fixed fields as you would see in OCLC connection on the visual materials work form. So for the type of record, your choice is going to be K, which is for a two-dimensional non-projected graphic. For the bibliographic level, you have to determine if this is a collection of photographs or if you're cataloging one single uh, very important photograph. As Rebecca mentioned, there is an option uh, to catalog portions of collections, or if you uh, really wanted to torture yourself, you could individually catalog every single photograph in a photo album, though uh, I do not know why you would do that to yourself, uh, and I do not recommend it. For TMAT type of visual material, your code's going to be I for picture. And for the technique field, it's just N for not applicable. That's only used for um, motion pictures and video recordings. Uh, you'll also have to construct the 007 field, which provides more details in an encoded format about the items in the collection. So for subfield A, category of material, um, your code is K, non-projected graphic. In subfield B, you have to specify the kinds of materials within the collection that you're working with. Uh, G is for photo negatives. H is for photo print, I for picture, and P for postcard, and there are a few others which I'm not going into at the moment. Um, picture is kind of the catch-all term for when you either don't know exactly what format it is or if there might be multiple kinds of um, non-projected graphics within the collection. You also have to specify the color of the items in subfield D, whether that's black and white, multicolored, hand-colored, mixed, or other. Uh, other is important to denote. Um, this includes tinted, toned, and stained items. So a sepia-toned photograph, for example, um, is coded Z for other. It's not black and white. Uh, for black and white, they literally mean black, white, and gray. You'll also have to say what the primary support material is. Um, these could be glass, for example, if you have a collection of glass plate negatives. It could be metal if you're working with tin types. It might often be mixed, it could be paper, or it could be you for unknown. And the guideline here is not to guess. If you're not certain that it's paper, um, or you think it might be some kind of uh, synthetic material, it's totally fine to just put you for unknown. Subfield F is for the secondary support material, like mounts or mats. Um, but for the most part, you'll only use this if the mat or mount is of historical or aesthetic importance. Um, and so it's not something that I use with any kind of regularity. If you are doing an RDA record or a combination RDA and DAX record, you'll also have to add your 33X fields. The 336 content type is going to be still image, and I've just copied the code out here for you. Uh, the 337 media type, uh, is unmediated, you know, it's a, a photo or a negative that you can just hold in your hand and look at. 338 is the carrier type. Um, here are a couple of the options. 
I used to get very confused differentiating between card and sheet. And from everything that I've read, it really is a matter of this, the size and thickness of the material. Uh, so card is going to be smaller and slightly thicker, uh, whereas sheet, you're really thinking of a sheet of paper. So most photographs, I would say, are cards. Um, and of course, if they're in a photo album, you could also use the 338 volume designation. Uh, and these fields are repeatable, so you can use as many as are appropriate for what you're working with. Um, let's talk about some of the coding now for projected graphics, starting once again with the fixed field. The type of record here is G for projected medium. Uh, the bibliographic level is either going to be C for collection or M for monograph slash item. The type of visual material uh, could be film strip, slide, or transparency. There are a few others that I haven't included here. And once again, the technique is not applicable because the uh, projected graphics are not videos. In the 007, your subfield A category of material is going to be G for projected graphic. Uh, in subfield B, um, you do have to specify your material designation. And here, I did not find something that was uh, a catch-all term like photograph, or um, sorry, for picture, for the non-projected graphics. Um, so you may have to make more liberal use of the category Z for other uh, if you're cataloging projected graphics. Uh, once again, um, say what kind of color uh, are on the items. Uh, subfield E is base of emulsion. Um, so this could be glass. It could be a synthetic material like plastic or vinyl. Um, it could be safety film. That is a film that's not nitrate. A different kind of film base, mixed or unknown. Uh, some of the guidelines here state that unless you know the film is nitrate film, uh, you can assume that it's safety film. Uh, and this is for the very good reason that nitrate film can be very dangerous. Under the wrong conditions, uh, it has been known to, uh, if I'm correct, spontaneously combust. Uh, so if you are working with nitrate film, I do hope that someone will have told you that before it gets to your desk. Uh, subfield F and subfield G, uh, for sound on the medium are not going to be used here. Again, these are graphic items, not videos or motion pictures, so they're going to be silent necessarily. Subfield H uh, for dimensions, that is going to be specific to each kind of material. Um, so rather than go over all of those, which are very, very specific, I've just included a link here um, so that you can look that up uh, when you have materials in front of you. And for subfield I, you're going to go over the secondary support material, um, whether that's cardboard, synthetics, mixed or unknown. Um, so the best example I can think of for the secondary support material is your photographic slide. You know, the, the image itself is on film, but there's usually a quite thick cardboard or paper mount that's around it so you can, be, so you can handle it more safely. Um, and so that's what's in this category, um, secondary support material. Uh, once again, you have to do the 3-3-X fields if you are doing an RDA or a hybrid DAX RDA record. The 3-3-6 content type will be still image. 3-3-7 media type will be projected. And the 3-3-8 carrier type, you have a couple different options here, uh, plus some others that I haven't gone into. Uh, let's talk about creating a title for your photographic record. Um, as Rebecca mentioned for manuscripts, a lot of photographic collections or photo albums aren't going to have formal titles. Uh, even if the album has something printed on the outside, it's likely to have been given by whoever made the album, like uh, family photos or photographs or something like that, something very generic that will not help your patron. Uh, the cataloger supplied titles that you'll be creating should be as descriptive as possible. Uh, and DAX gives us some guidelines for what needs to be in that title. Uh, DAX 2.3.3 requires three things, the name segment, the nature of material segment, and an optional topical segment. And so I've just given some examples here um, to kind of go over what that looks like. So example one is Shipler Commercial Photographers Photograph Collection. The name segment is Shipler Commercial Photographers, and the nature of materials is Photograph Collection. Similarly, for George Green Family Photograph Album, uh, George Green family is the name. 
the nature of material segment is family photograph album. Uh, however, it could be more specific. Uh, in this next example, the Cynthia Lopez photographs of Utah pictographs, the name segments Cynthia Lopez, nature of materials are photographs, and the topical segment is Utah pictographs. Uh, or um, for this last one, Sarah and Yui Yamamoto is the name, portrait is the nature of materials segment. And while the title should be as descriptive as possible, you really don't have to go overboard here. Um, if the family photo album, for example, has children and vacations and cars and the family business, you don't have to squash that all in there in the title. It really doesn't need to be like three lines long. Um, family photograph album, I think, gives patrons enough information to have a sense of what they're going to see. And that's really what's important. Uh, the creator field for photographic collections can be a little tricky. Um, a lot of photo collections, especially if, it's, if they've been sitting in the backlog for a long time uh, or have not had good paperwork or the paperwork's been lost, um, they may be truly anonymous at this point, unfortunately. Um, I think we all might be familiar with finding a, a photo album uh, that has been unfortunately neglected for some time and we don't know who anyone in the photographs are. Um, and while that might be unfortunate, it doesn't mean that you can't uh, work with the collection. An important thing to remember is that for decks especially, the collectors and compilers of these collections are considered the creators and as such they can be in the 100 field. And uh, let's do a couple examples. Uh, let's say for the Schiffler Commercial Photographers Photograph Collection, we know that all the photos were taken by Schiffler Commercial Photographers, so we can put them in the 110 field as the creator. But um, what if some of the photo, what if some of the photographers are named on the individual photos? We can also put them in the 700 field. And if those names are available, please do include them. Uh, and if they don't have um, an authorized heading uh, in LC authorities, um, you can always create one. For the George Green family photograph album, uh, George Green is the compiler, so he goes in the 100 field, um, but in that case, we don't know who exactly took the photographs. You know, it could have been George or his wife or one of the kids or a grandparent. Um, and, you know, we don't need to guess or do too much work or, you know, badger a patron to kind of figure that out. And of course, uh, some things might be just truly anonymous. Uh, let's say for the Sarah and Yui Yamamoto portrait, their names and the date the photo was taken was penciled in at the back, but we don't have the name of a studio or a photographer or anything. Um, so we can just not have a creator field and that's totally fine. Again, if you are working with um, an RDA or DAX RDA hybrid, you'll probably also want to add your 260 or 264 fields. Though I will note that uh, MARC records converted from EAD files will probably not have anything in this field because they're more likely to be just pure DAX records. Uh, and a lot of the photograph records that I work with are these converted EAD files. And again, that's fine. It's up to you to determine which standards you want to use to, to catalog. If you are uh, using RDA, um, you will have to use the 260 or 264 field. However, the only core element is the date of production or that subfield C. Though, if the information is known, please do fill in all the other subfields. So for the Shipper Commercial Photographer's Photograph Collection, we know that the photo studio was in Salt Lake City. Um, so even if it's not anywhere on the photos, in brackets, we can say uh, in subfield A that it's Salt Lake City, Utah. Um, we know that Shipler took these photos so they can go in subfield B. And in subfield C, we have the dates for the photograph collection. For the Sarah and Yui Yamamoto portrait, we don't know where it was taken or who took it, so we're only going to use subfield C. And you may have noticed that the 245 title fields here are constructed a bit differently than on the previous slides. Um, that's because the subfield F for dates in the title field um, is mostly for a pure DAX record that's not gonna have this publication information. If you're using RDA, uh, instead of having subfield F, that information should only go in the 260 or 264 field subfield C. It really shouldn't be replicated in both places. 
Uh, for extent, that is the 300 field in a MARC record, uh, DAX and RDA have very similar guidelines. Uh, DAX 2.5.4 says that we should record the number of linear feet, number of items, and or the number of containers or carriers. And RDA 3.4.1.11 uh, says that you should record the number of items, containers, volumes, the amount of storage space required, and or the number and types of units in the collection. And so based on your local practices and what you think is going to be most helpful for patrons, that could look like a couple different things. Uh, you could say that something is six boxes and three linear feet. You could say that something is approximately 250 photographs. Um, or you could build a quite large field where you say that something is one photograph album, in parentheses, 73 individual photographs. Some of them are color, and then you have the dimensions of the photo album. And again, that depends on how your institution is recording this information. Um, so do try to keep it um, consistent with what records have looked like in the past. Uh, subject headings are really, really important um, when you're working with collection level records. Because as I said earlier, um, unlike the full finding aid, you're not going to have a list of the folder titles or the headings of manuscript components or anything like that. Um, you won't have that full text, full keyword searchability function as you would in a database for, that was designed for finding aids. Uh, and so your subject headings are really the only way to provide some of that context. In, you know, quote unquote, normal cataloging, um, we have something called the 20% rule. And that states that um, in order to merit a subject heading, uh, something has to comprise 20% of the content of what you're cataloging. And uh, for archival collections in general, and especially photographs, I, I do not follow that rule. I think you can just throw it right out the window and do what's going to help your patrons. Um, if you have a photo collection and there is one photograph of a president, put a name heading for the, for the president. That is something that your patrons might want to find independent of the rest of the photos. I personally remember working on a collection of photos from around 1915, and they were kind of like still life and home life kind of content. Um, but there were about three photos of wheelchairs, you know, in this collection of about 40 or 50 photographs. And to me, that was significant enough and interesting enough to merit its own subject heading. Um, but you know what your patrons are looking for. You know your institution's um, focuses in what they collect. And so you can kind of play with that. Um, as you think it's going to help your patron. There are some key subfield V headings that I do want to point out. Uh, the one you're going to see most often is subfield V for photographs, and that includes photographic prints or digital photographs. Subfield V slides is another one, and subfield V pictorial works, which I have to admit I use to cover a lot of sins. Uh, subfield V pictorial works I use whenever I can't apply something more specific because I do want patrons to realize that these are images of things. There's no text, you know, there's none of that uh, written content or context that they might expect. Because um, even though we might say photograph collection in the title, uh, you will still get people coming into the reading room and wanting some of that context that we unfortunately can't provide sometimes. However, very important, do not use subfield V negatives. That is not a valid subheading. Uh, negatives as a subheading should go in the subfield X, and that is exclusively used for linguistic material. So essentially how you say no and how you negate things in different languages. Um, it has nothing to do with photos. Please do not use subfield D negatives. And uh, here are some examples um, of different kinds of subject headings you might assign. You could have a 600 field for a family name for a family photo album. Um, if that photo album contained uh, a couple pictures of Mark Twain, because this family was, you know, chummy with him, you could include uh, a subject heading for Mark Twain. You know, you might have a collection of medical slides for um, a science course, for example, and they might feature images of dog anatomy. You could have photographs of buildings in Salt Lake City, or you could have an entire collection of photographs specifically of Temple Square. You know, be as specific as you can. Um, or be as broad as you need to. There's a lot of flexibility here. And once again, focus, focus, focus on your patrons. How would someone use this collection? What could they 
you know, if they wanted to see photos of this topic, would this be a good resource for them? And really try to get in that headspace. And genre form terms are also really important um, when working with photo collections. Unfortunately, uh, LCGFT does not have a ton of them, uh, but it is better than it used to be. When I first started cataloging photo collections, photographs was not even a valid LCGFT heading, uh, which just kind of boggles the mind, but it is now. And it's also been broken out into a couple different uh, specific categories. So you can say that something's a documentary photograph, you can say that it's a negative, and they even have a, a separate heading for selfies, which I thought was just a little funny. Um, something could be a postcard, uh, or they have this generic heading for albums, parentheses, books, you know, which technically is what a photo album is, but I just find this heading to be very unhelpful, and it's honestly quite confusing for patrons. And so when I'm working with visual materials, I'm most often gonna look at the Getty Art and Architecture Thesaurus because they are you know, part of an art museum and they have so many different kinds of headings that you'll be able to use. You can specify black and white or color photographs. You can say if something's a daguerreotype or a diffusion transfer print, which is the technical term for a Polaroid, which I did not know before researching this. Uh, they have a specific heading for photograph albums, uh, for studio portraits and for spirit photographs, uh, which is the term used when you're trying to take a picture of a ghost, which I did not expect to have its own genre heading, but there you have it. You can catalog for a long time and still learn something new, which is why I like this profession. Uh, once again, use as many of these headings as fits the collection. Um, what's really nice about the Getty Art and, Architect Art and Architecture Thesaurus is their browsing capability. As you're looking at the heading, um, you'll see kind of a hierarchy of the terms. And if you click on the blue boxes to the left of that, you can just browse within the different categories. Um, so if you can't find the, the one term you're looking for, look for something similar and browse in the hierarchy and see if um, you have that light bulb moment of, oh yes, that is the term that I'm looking for. Uh, because with any controlled vocabulary, uh, there will be things that are not what I would call common English parlance. Um, you do have to distinguish between very similar kinds of materials sometimes, uh, and that means they get a little uh, loosey-goosey with language that you or I would just understand. Um, so in the interest of time, we are going to move to the questions section, um, and this will be for anything that Rebecca or I have talked about so far. Uh, I know that we had a couple questions uh, come in before. Um, it looks like the question of why is transcription not important, which was directed at Rebecca, might have been answered in chat already. Um, but Rebecca, if you have anything else to add, please go ahead. And everyone else, uh, type in your questions now. Uh, I will mute myself and Rebecca and I will kind of trade off as those questions come up. Sure, so I guess I'll just share um, what I shared in the box about that question of why transcription is not so important with uh, manuscript collection cataloging. And that's because the um, types of materials that you're cataloging are going to be just like artifacts of life, letters that were written or documents that were created. They don't, they don't identify themselves. They don't have a title written on them. They don't have publication information written on them. So you're not needing to transcribe those pieces of information into a catalog record. Instead, you're looking for guidance on how to formulate those titles in a consistent way or the production information in a consistent way that um, is true to the integrity um, and um, helps people to find and understand what that item is. So that's my answer to that question. And then I also did include links to those standards that I um, referenced in my presentation in the chat as well. Other questions?
it looks like not. Um, so if you have a question that comes to mind later, uh, we will have another question and answer period at the end of the presentation. Um, so you can just hold on to that for now. Um, unless something comes in the next 30 seconds, uh, I vote that we go ahead and break early um, and we can all come back here at 2.45 for the continuation of uh, the presentation. <laughs>